have some questions about Easter. You're not alone. Experts are here. They have lots of opinions, so good luck with that. All right. Come on in. Hi. <laughs> Why are we laughing? How are y'all? Good. Do you know what we're talking about today? No. Easter. Easter. That's right. So what do we celebrate on Easter? Um, parties. Parties. Yes, it's a big party. Ben, tell me why we had such a big party on Easter. Because it's Jesus' birthday. Is it? Yes. Can y'all draw me a picture of the Easter story? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Leo, <laughs> that is awesome. Has less hair oh, than I would have imagined, but oh, that's great. What is, what? It's Jesus at the Staples. Jesus is at Staples, picking up some office supplies. Iris, when you think of Jesus, what animal comes to mind? A wolf, a donkey, a horse. Oh, a horse. I have horses. Giraffe, probably. A giraffe. Have you ever thought about Jesus being a lamb? Yes. Yes. What happened after he died on the cross? He got in the tomb. Then what happened when Jesus went in the tomb? He moved the stone. And he came out of the tomb. Gracie, what do you think Jesus would have said when he came out of the tomb? Um, thank you so much for getting me out. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a friend who didn't know anything about Jesus, what's the first thing you would tell them? I want to be kind to you. I want to be kind to you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful thing to say. And then she's out. She's done. Morgan, tell me about the Easter story. The bunny baby brings <laughs> an um, Easter basket to everyone. But somebody else brought something to everyone. Who was that? Um, about, um, babies? about, um, Santa. I have failed as a parent. Whose shoe is this? Why? Put your shoe on. Your feet stink. <laughs> well, this went really well. No matter what it took for you to get here today, I'm glad you're here. Happy Easter.
History books are full of the stories of once grand kingdoms. Palaces built for kings and queens who sought fame and chased glory. Those who conquered their enemies and ruled by might. They grew powerful empires, defeated the weak, and built walls around their wealth. Their stories are legendary. But those kingdoms, no matter how grand, now serve only as a monument to rulers that once were. They were built with stones that have now toppled and with power that has since faded. You see, a kingdom that would never end would need a king who was unlike any other. A king that didn't come to be served, but to serve. A king who elevated the lowly, healed the hurting, and traded a royal robe for a towel to wash feet. And then, in history's greatest act of love, this king would lay down his life for the sake of the whole world, taking our guilt and our shame, offering us life and hope and inviting us all to participate in his upside down kingdom.
Lord was crucified, Pilate spent a good deal of time talking to Jesus, both pushing back on the Jews who had brought this man that he just didn't want to deal with, and also trying to sort out in his own mind, who is this person? And so there was a point in the midst of this drama that was playing out where they had taken Jesus back again and he had been beaten and they twisted the crown of thorns and they put a purple robe on him. And when Jesus came back out in front of everyone, Pilate said to them, here is the man. And in that moment, what they were doing is they were making a mockery of Jesus They were making a mockery of Jesus, and even more than that, they were sending a message that anyone who would choose to follow him would be mocked as well. But in that moment, there weren't many who were following him. And certainly on that first Easter, there weren't exactly any Jesus followers. There weren't any Christians that first Easter. Because even though there were people who loved Jesus, what they were trying to sort out in their brain is what kind of king could be taken down? What kind of king would wash feet? What kind of king would willingly give his life? And so they arrived at that first Easter, not knowing it was Easter not expecting much of anything. As Andy Stanley likes to say, nobody was expecting no body. But the story of Easter, the reason we are here today as evidence that it wasn't over is because in that moment, the story was only beginning. When Jesus went to the cross, his last words were, it is finished. What Jesus did not say was, I am finished. Jesus was just getting started. Welcome to Easter. Welcome to Ashley Ridge Church. Welcome to a place and a space that we have set aside to tell this incredible story, to remember that there is no other king like our King Jesus.
he did who paid for all of our sins nobody but jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave
feeling it, feeling it in here. Now Mary stood outside of the tomb crying. Crying, tears that she couldn't explain, that she couldn't fully comprehend, weeping for a friend she had lost, weeping over a horror she had witnessed in the days prior. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Can y'all picture that? Picture that with me this morning. Mary's distraught. She's ugly crying. She gets to the tomb and she peeks inside and there's two angels sitting on the bench. And in my mind, they waved. Right? <laughs> hey. Right? And then they notice that she's crying. And they say, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. She didn't know that the person standing there was Jesus. And so he asked her, same question, she must have really been crying, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And so Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary didn't know who Jesus was. We don't know why, we don't, we, don't, we don't think he was in a costume, but we don't, we, you know, he'd been dead three days. I don't know what happens in that amount of time. His skincare routine was way off. She does not know who he is. More than that, more than that, and I think this was something John wanted us to understand as he told this story, is that not only did she not recognize him, but he, she also, she didn't know who Jesus was. She knew that her friend had been killed. She knew that a bunch of people made accusations that they knew were false. She knew that they had carried him away to this tomb. She knew that this man that she loved, that knew her, that saw her, was no longer with them. But because this was so crazy, because no other king would finish a story like that. And you have to wonder if Mary was close enough. Because there were a few of the ladies that stayed at the cross. When others ran, they stayed. And maybe she heard him say, it is finished. And she thought, this is the end of the story. And who would finish a story like that. Mary didn't know who Jesus was until, until in the most personal and intimate way, Jesus looks at her and he calls her by her name. And in that moment, she realized that this story wasn't done. She realized that there was a whole lot of the rules of the universe that had been altered and she couldn't explain it. She didn't have the physics to understand it. She didn't have the biology to understand it. There was no rational explanation other than the fact that she knew that this was her Lord. And more than that, this is what I love in this moment, the word that she cries out 
as he calls her by her first name. And as she looks at him in that moment, she calls out Rabboni, which means teacher. Teacher. The one who paid attention to me. The one who showed me things that I had never seen before. The one who introduced a world to me that was so incredibly different. She didn't know until she did. And then here's the thing about knowing something. Is once she knew that this was her Lord, that this was her teacher, she went and she told everyone what he had said to her. Jesus said, go. And she didn't hesitate. She went. And it's because knowing things changes things. Knowing things changes things. And we know that this is true. I could come up with 8,000 examples, but there, there's just some that are so readily available. Knowing things changes things. Have you watched, and I know a lot of you have, all of you have, have you watched a, a baby when they take those first steps? Right? Like there's the whole wobbly thing, and there's the whole reaching thing, and there's the whole I'm kind of a zombie, but I'm a baby thing that's going on. And, and they're trying to figure this out. But as soon as they get their legs under them, and as soon as they put enough of the pieces in place, and they take those couple of steps, like immediately, not, you know, not casually, immediately they stand up straighter. Right? As soon as that confidence starts to be there, they stand up straighter. Because as soon as they start to do this, they realize that they can now get from point A to point I want that so much faster than they could before. And once, as adults, you know, when you can get from point A to point that's what I want, you go and you get there in the fastest way possible. And so once a child learns to walk, you, you don't really see this. Some of you are going to be like, no, I've seen this. No, you haven't. You, what you don't see is the child sit back down and be like, nah, I'd rather stay here. Right? Because not only did they experience this, like, I could get to these things and I have access that I didn't have before. And I bet I could get my hands on that. And if I can walk there, I can climb that. And if I can walk there, I can run there. Not only are they processing all of this and moving, but then there's all these people around them that as soon as they do any of it are like, Right? And so not only do they know that this thing works for them, they know that this, in this one act, they can gain the attention and the delight of all these people around them. And it's one of those critical moments that you get to watch in a child's development where everything starts to change because knowing things changes things. In the same way that Jesus was a teacher to his followers, I think so many of you in this room professionally have gone a route of teaching, not because a lot of the perks are awesome. There's spring break, there's that. But you did it and you're doing it because you know that knowing things changes things. Giving someone access to information that can start to guide them and shape them, that allows them to function in the world differently than they could before. That's why despite everything else, we come back to it. Even not professionally, think about all the avenues in our lives that we gravitate to this role of once you know something that changes your life, you want to help somebody else discover it. And so here's the thing about that first Easter. I already told you, nobody was really a Jesus follower. They were Jesus friends. They were Jesus, um, they were Jesus mourners. But there weren't really any Jesus followers at this point on that first Easter. They didn't know what to think. And they didn't even understand what they sort of, kind of, knew. But then as the Easter story unfolds, we get all of these moments of encounter. We get that first moment of encounter with Mary, who, who just doesn't know until she knows. And then we get moments of encounter when Jesus is walking along the road to Emmaus, right? 
And he's walking with these two guys, and they're trying to piece it all together. And they're trying to go, well, this is what I thought I knew. And did you hear him say that part? And so you knew this, and I knew this. And together, we might know this, except none of it's adding up. And for them, it was in the moment when they got to the house that they were staying, and Jesus broke the bread. The lights went back on. We were in a room with this man. And he showed us and he told us only what we thought we knew in that moment didn't make any sense. And then we saw him get killed. But oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this is Jesus. And then Jesus shows up in the middle of a locked room to his disciples. And he says, peace, I leave with you. And that's after he says, stop freaking out. Right? The translations do not be afraid. But you got to know that they were losing it. They were losing it when Jesus showed up in that room. And he says, it's okay, guys. My peace, I leave with you. My peace, I bring to you. It's me. It's Jesus. And they were amazed. They still didn't know all of the things. But they knew this was him. But this is funny, and this is why we like the disciples, is they're so much like so many of us, is they knew it that night, and then they went to bed, and they forgot everything they knew. That ever happened to you? Right? Did you ever tell your parents, you know, I knew it the night before when I studied it, and then I got to the test, and I didn't know any of it, and I'm sure it was the dog's fault, right? Like, there's, because they knew it, but it still was so strange and so outside of their realm of understanding that the next day, Jesus goes out, and he's standing on the beach, and the disciples were fishing. They didn't know what else to do. Life was being real weird. They're like, hey, guys, let's go fishing. That's what some of y'all do, too. They're like, life's too much. Let's go fishing. And so they're out there fishing. And Jesus comes and he stands on the shore, and it says they don't know who it is. And then they have this moment where they figure it out, and we're going to get there in a minute. But the reason I'm, I'm trying to help us see some of these stories, even from the first Easter, is that what I know about you and what I know about me is it takes different things for all of us to start to realize who Jesus is. For some of you, you were taught your whole life. That Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And, and the reason that it resonate was probably not because you read the Bible all over and over and you kept getting that. But the same people who sang to you, Jesus loves me, this I know, were showing you day by day that this Jesus was real. Some of you didn't grow up hearing that song. Some of you grew up in very different circumstances, and maybe you even grew up with a bias against that piece of information. This world is messed up. This world is cruel. There's evilness. There's brokenness. There's pain. There's suffering. How could there be a good God? We did a whole series on that a couple months ago. Y'all go back and check it out, right? But there are people, some of you in this room that are like this, that you grew up with this sense that I know that there's these people and they follow Jesus, but that just feels like another option and another way that people are trying to get through this life. But then for some of you, the reason you're here today is somewhere along the way, you got surprised. You got surprised. Maybe someone invited you. Maybe somebody told you something about what God was doing in their life. But you got surprised by the fact that maybe there was more to this story than you actually realized. For some reason or another, you were invited or you were in a circumstance that caused you to lean in or to look or to wonder, even for just a moment, and you knew something. You started to see something that you didn't know before. And so for one reason or another, we all showed up here today. Some of it's because your mom said, show up here today. Okay? But we all showed up here today because as much or as little as we know, there is part of us leaning into this story that says there is only one person in all of human history who predicted his death, who predicted his resurrection, and then he did it. And so many people saw Jesus 
And so many people shared their stories. He said my name. He broke the bread. We, we went fishing. He met us on the shore. He found me in the midst of my circumstances. I was lost, but then he found me. I was broken. I had nowhere to turn. And then Jesus met me there. And when we have those moments, it makes us consider, right? This is what knowing and learning is all about. It makes us start to consider everything Jesus has said and done to that point with just a little more weight. If he is the light of the world, what if he is the bread of life? What if he is the gate? And what if he is the good shepherd? And what if he is the vine? What if he is the resurrection and the life and death doesn't win? What if? Just what if? Because if any part of that could possibly be true, then this changes everything. Because here's the next layer to this. Knowing things changes things, but only if we let it. All right? Go with me here. Knowing things changes things, but only if we let it. All right? If you were here at Christmas, I talked about burgers and fries. I'm going to talk about burgers and fries again. Okay? There was a moment, and y'all are like, oh, right? What you meant was, God's with me. I remember, Pastor Jen. Okay, here's the thing. There was a point in my life where I did not know the calorie count in a Five Guys burger and fries. Okay? Those were glorious days. Those were beautiful days of freedom and love and laughter and frolicking in fields of wildflowers. Okay? And then there came a day where the cruelest friend I've ever known... Okay, told me how many calories. And for a moment, there was shock. And then for a moment, there was, maybe I should not go to there. But knowing things only changes things if you let it. And I want you to know I got over it. I want you to know that I decided that I don't care because Jesus is alive and I have freedom. So bring on the burger and fries. Quite conversely, I know that kale is better for me than sour gummy bears and I don't care because I also know that kale is gross. I don't care. I don't need, I don't need your recipes after worship for how if you bake it and if you put oil and salt and paprika, I don't care. Put your paprika on your deviled eggs, okay? Kale is gross. This is what you're going to remember about Easter, isn't it? <laughs> this is what I want you to do remember. I do want you to remember this. Knowing things changes things, but only if we let it. And the problem, the problem in our world today is not the lack of evidence about Jesus and what we don't know. I'm going to say that again. The problem in our world today is not the lack of evidence that God is real and God was with us and that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. There is evidence everywhere. The problem is that too many people who know at least something, okay? Some of you are in the room, you're like, I'm in first grade, Pastor Jen, back off that so many of us know at least something of the goodness of God. And there's at least something that we know about the sacrifice of Jesus for us. And yet we choose to let it be irrelevant in the way we live our lives. We know things. We don't know everything. We don't know a lot of things. We don't totally understand everything we do know. But for a lot of us in this room, and some of you, you are still on a journey. Keep leaning in. But for a lot of in this room, we know something. Some
something to the goodness of God. And let me go back to teacher Jesus. This is why I think there was a moment he was walking with his disciples. And he said, it takes faith the size of a mustard seed. Do you know how small a mustard seed is? It is tiny. And Jesus was telling him in that moment, you're not going to know it all. You're not going to know everything. You're not going to understand everything. But with just this little bit that you're going to know and see and experience of the goodness of God and the sacrifice of Jesus for you, it can change everything. But you got to let it. You've got to let it change your life. And so the question that I'm asking you this Easter, and I'm not off the hook either, the question I'm asking me, the question I'm asking you this Easter is what will you do with what you know? What will you do? Don't just stand in here and dance and sing. You should dance and sing, okay, while you're in this room. We dance and sing on Sundays, right, Davis? That's right. We dance and we sing. If you were at Easter Jam last week, we dance and we sing on Sundays. But what are you going to do with this thing that you know? For Mary, she ran off to tell everyone. And she did it for two reasons. One, Jesus told her to. He said, go. And so she went. We could learn something. That's next year's Easter message. Someone write that down. Okay? He said, go. So she went. She knew something. Something so profound that she had to do something about it. And I can only imagine when she got back to everyone else and said, I've seen the Lord. And he told me, don't hold on to me, for I have yet, I'm going to your father and my father, your God and my God. Go and tell them these things. And she's like, so then he told me that. And then he told me to go. And here I am. And I'm sure that they looked at her and they were like, what? We have questions. She's like, I don't have answers. Let me tell you again. I have seen the Lord. And then he said to me, do not hold on to me. I don't know everything, but I know what I saw. And I know that there's only one person who looked at me like that and who knew me like that and who calls me by my name like that. And I just saw him. He was dead and now he is alive. For Peter, and here's where I want to get back to that story the next day, when Peter realizes that it's the Lord standing over there on the beach, Peter, for the second time in his young career as a disciple, jumps into the water and just starts to take off. This is in the last chapter of John's telling of this story. John 21, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Okay? They still didn't know. They were trying to get their heads around this. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John. He liked to talk about himself like that. Um, the one whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. He was hot and he was fishing and there were a lot of fish. But he wrapped it back around him and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. They were all like, we got it this far, Peter. It's your turn. All right. So Peter goes back. He brings the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 large fish. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have some Krispy Kreme. And none of the disciples, just checking to make sure, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew. They knew that it was the Lord. They'd seen that fish thing before. They'd seen Jesus set a table and serve a meal before. 
They had seen Jesus show up in the middle of their everyday lives before. They didn't know just a few minutes ago, but now no one asked the question. John goes out of, out of his way to say, no one at this point said, who is this man? Because they knew it was the Lord. And so Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. They didn't know until they did know. And when they knew, they had to do something about it. And as the story goes, Mary and Peter and the rest of the disciples, they went on to stake their lives and even to lose their lives over this incredible thing that they knew. We know things that could change things. Go with me here. We know things that could change things, but only if we let it. And so before we leave and before we sing again and get back to celebrating this incredible thing, I just want to give you a couple of quick suggestions that go along with what these first disciples did. As we start to think about what are we going to do with this thing that we know, how are we going to let it change us? How does it make everything different? We could do like all of the earliest disciples did at Jesus' invitation. They went and they saw. Jesus' invitation is so consistent. Come and see. And so they went and they saw. And along the way, they had a lot of questions. And you know what? Jesus didn't say, no more questions. Jesus said, let the little children come. They asked the best questions, right? Let him come. He said, come and see. Let's talk about it. When you know just enough to know that this guy is something, then don't waste any time waiting to just understand. Go and see. Take Jesus up on his invitation. And then if you want to be like Mary that first Easter, you got to tell someone else. You got to tell someone else. When you know something of the goodness of God, you got to tell somebody else. And the setting's not always perfect, and the time isn't always right, and you're not always going to have the best words, but don't waste any time telling someone that I, I didn't know, and then Jesus met me at the point of my greatest need. And he can do that for you, too. I thought nobody saw my pain. I thought nobody knew my need. But it turns out that Jesus never lost sight of me and you probably know somebody that needs that reminder this week that needs that reminder today knowing things changes things when we know we tell someone else and then this is the one that I love and the reason I didn't want you guys to miss that beach story and the fish story is that one of the coolest things about Easter is the same group of people that Jesus was again later going to tell that you need to go into all the world and you need to tell everyone and you need to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That same group of people was the group of people that in that moment when it dawned on them that they, they didn't have the question anymore, who is that? Because they knew it was the Lord. They got back to Jesus as quickly as possible. They got back to Jesus as quickly as possible. Some of us go to Jesus once, and then we don't come back. And then we think that he left. And we think that he moved. Where Jesus is alive. And so we get back to Jesus. And some of you, I know you're asking the question, how do I do that? If it was obvious, I would do it all the time. One of the easiest ways that we do that is when we show up to worship. To remember together that God is good. And you don't have to show up to worship here every Sunday. We'd sure love it if you did. But you don't have to show up here. Show up to worship in your car. Show up to put words in your mouth that change the narrative about what this world looks like and what we know it is because we have a Savior who lives. Because he lives, it changes all of our life, it changes everything. And I love this, and I love this. You have to hear this. 
It's no longer eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. Russell Moore said this. He said, eat, drink, and be merry, for yesterday we were dead, and now we're not. Eat, drink, and be merry. Live with expectation. Live with hope. Live with the sense that God is doing something in this world. Know something that changes something and let it define your life. I'm going to say it as bluntly as I know how. In a world that feels like it has lost its ever-loving mind, we can sing anyway. We can celebrate anyway. We can offer forgiveness even when it doesn't feel warranted. We can try again when we want to quit. We can choose joy when our hearts are heavy. We can be pressed, but we can choose and remember that we are not crushed. Because he lives, the rules have changed. And I asked James to be ready to come out here with me at the end because for many of you in this room this is a familiar piece of our faith this is a familiar song and a familiar reminder that because this is true because we know that we have seen the goodness of God in the land of the living then we can face tomorrow and so some of you know this song, and I just want to invite you to, to sing it if you know it. But let's remember this together. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to us. Heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives. All fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because He lives. Almighty God, we showed up to Easter today with so many questions still in our mind. So many questions about why, why we do this and what this means and how crazy is it that you came for us? That you were so crazy about us that you would send your best gift, you would send your son, Jesus, to give his life on a cross, to heal, to forgive, to live, and ultimately to die so that we would know there's no limit to your incredible love for us. And then even then, the story wasn't finished because you are alive. It's the story of our life. It's the story of our faith, and it changes things. And so God, our prayer this Easter changes again. Show us just a little bit more. Help us to know something in a way that helps us walk into tomorrow with a greater expectation that our hope cannot be taken. That our freedom in Christ is not in danger. That we can live with boldness because we have nothing to lose. Jesus, you are our everything. And because you live, we want to live too. We want to live the way you are inviting us to live. And so Jesus, do something new in us today. Help us to hold on 
even tighter. Help us to get back to you as often and as quickly as we can to sit at your feet and remember who we are and whose we are. Because he lives, we get to live to all glory and thanks and praise be to God Almighty. without hope and no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my light began and ash was redeemed only beauty remains in my orphan heart My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began You know your grace, suffering washes over chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. No. 
got one more song to celebrate. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, treasures and fame.
I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know that we got to celebrate together, the center of our faith, the story of who we are that is still just getting started because Jesus has so much to do in us. Starting next week, we've been on a new series, As It Is in Heaven. We're going to talk about what is heaven, even a little bit about what is hell. We're going to cover the bases. It's going to be a whole lot of fun, and I hope that you come back for that. I've got one other kind of big thing to tell you. You ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. You sure you're ready? Are you ready? They're not ready. They're not ready? No, they're not ready. They're not Are you ready? ready? <laughs> okay. okay. Here it is. I would like to officially invite you to the groundbreaking ceremony of our new building on May 21st. May 21st. Y'all. We are so pumped, we're so excited. May 21st, we're throwing a party, you're all invited. We are breaking ground on this thing. It is about to get started. Happy Easter, we love y'all. See you next Sunday. Good job, good job. Good we job, everyone.